Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Woe. Alrighty, so I have a different kind of style of review for you guys today. We're gonna see how this goes. I'm gonna do a get ready with me review while doing three isolated closed circle mystery reviews. So to explain both halves of <laughs> this style of a review, so I do a series, it's been a while. It's been like six months since I've gotten to do one of these. Actually, it's been it's been a really long time and I'm trying to get back into it. But I do a style of review video where I take three isolated closed circle mysteries, uh, which are basically everybody's stuck somewhere, somebody dies. We gotta figure out who done it because more people are gonna die if we don't. It's that trope and mystery. Uh, I take three of them and I do kind of a compare and contrast, talking about what I like, what I don't like. And because I realized that I thought this would be a much chattier version of a review than I normally do, I thought that I would also do a chit chat get ready with me which is where you talk to people while you put on your makeup. I have done this before and um, I think the last time I did it was for my mid-year book Freakout Tag and I've gotten comments from people saying that they like that as a, a style of video from me. So we'll see how this goes. This is sort of a weird mashup. I find it really relaxing to watch other people do their makeup. I have some new things to play with for um, for my birthday. I got myself some JD Glow special shades, which are supposed to be comparable to the Pat McGrath ones. And the other thing I got myself were some unicorn flakies from Hello Taco. Anyway, I thought that that these would be fun to play with and since this was going to be sort of a chattier review anyway I thought this might be a fun format so we'll see how this goes I've never done a review quite like this so hopefully I can edit it and do something enjoyable for all so the reason that I wanted to compare the three books that we are going to be comparing today is that two of them are more recent reads for me like within the last year that both made me think about kind of the er text of this particular subgenre in a new and fun way and I've realized that I've never actually done a full review of the OG version of this trope which is And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie which if you don't know is my I think fourth favorite book ever. This is my favorite trope as we've been discussing and this is like the best version of the story that has ever been told. I have yet to read one anyway that I think is better. So that I realized that I've never actually in the context of these three three book reviews uh, reviewed that particular one and considering that a lot of the uh, books in this subgenre are basically retellings of that particular story, I thought that it would make sense to specifically maybe have one of these calling it out because the two other books that I would like to review in this particular video are They All Fall Down by Rachel Housel Hall, which is explicitly a retelling, like I mentioned, it's pretty common, but this is explicitly a retelling of And Then There Were None. And then the other book I want to talk about is Death in the Family by Tessa Wiegert, which is not necessarily a direct retelling, but it has a lot of the same elements. And and then there were none is clearly like a five star pick for me. It's like one of my all time favorite books, which is how I define a five star. But uh, the other two are not. Death in the Family, I think I ended up giving like four stars to just because I had such a good time in it. And maybe we can talk about like the ways that it reminded me of and then of and then there were none that I enjoyed that kind of made it work pretty well for me. They All Fell Down was only like two stars, I think, two and a half, something like that. Like it was not my favorite, let's just say. So I thought that we could talk about the ways that it deviates from the original formula of this kind of story and like why in this case I didn't feel like it was successful. And I think it made me appreciate some of what I think the key elements of And Then There Were None are that make a retelling of it or that make other books that are trying to use that same trope more or less successful. Okay, so quick recap of like sort of the basic plot beats of And Then There Were None so that we can then compare and contrast. So And Then There Were None is 10 strangers ostensibly coming to this island that is sort of like a famous island. It's like notorious. And they all think that they are going for a house party for different reasons and with different hosts. You find that out pretty quickly because you have a bunch of different points of view. And when we, when they get there, they realize like they've been kind of brought there under false pretenses and quickly things get murdery. And there's sort of like a pattern that is followed from there of how things are getting murdery, bing, bang, boom. By the end, we find out like why all that was happening. 
and go from there. So that's sort of like the core elements are strangers gathering together on some sort of place where they can't get away from each other and then people start dying and they have to figure out why and like I think the best well maybe we can get into that but like part of what is key in that formula is that there is like a specific reason or there is some sort of like connecting thread and part of the thrill for you as the reader is trying to figure out what like what is that connecting thread is bringing everyone together? Like why are these people the ones who have been gathered? Or if it's a variant of the story where people do know each other, then the thrill becomes wh who amongst these people who do know each other has been like holding a big grudge and is, you know, unleashing their fury on the rest of them. So that's sort of like the pleasure of this type of book. Part of what I think makes And Then There Were None, which like I said, this is the OG. Like this is the one that does it the best in my opinion. Part of what makes it so successful, I think, is that you are in pretty much like many of the characters' points of view, if not all. I can't quite remember if you actually end up getting to go into everyone's headspace, but you are in most of these characters' headspaces. And so you like, you're getting the narration from a bunch of different points of view. It creates a thrill because the author sometimes might be in the head of the person who ends up being the killer. Sometimes in these books, it is somebody from the outside. Sometimes it is the people that we meet initially on the front of the page, but you don't know that in these mysteries. And so part of being in all these different points of view is you might be in the head of a killer, basically. Like the narration from at least one of these people may very well be the narration of the killer. You also, by having all of those different points of views, I think you end up having this really nice sort of layering effect to your perceptions of all of the characters, even if you do end up having like a couple of main narrators, which is I think often the case in multiple point of view type stories. Usually you like, let's say if you had 10 point of view characters, it would not be atypical for three of them to be sort of the main ones you're you're in their head. Like that's, that's pretty typical and I don't have a problem with that. But by getting the perspectives from those other seven people, you are getting additional insight into the narration and how reliable that narration is from by like seeing different points of views. I think one of the key issues with they all fall down is that it really it's in the head of one character and that character is pretty early on established to be not too reliable because of some of the mental health issues that they have and that's what creates a weird like I, I have really conflicting feelings about this book because the char the main character herself is an interesting character it's not that like she's this terrible character who wouldn't be good in any book that's not the situation the situation is that because we only are getting things from her point of view and because we know like almost from the jump that she's not reliable it just doesn't it just creates a sort of flatness I think to the overall characterization because we're only getting a limited point of view and we know that that limited point of view is not reliable and like you don't I don't think you have enough information to really get a sense of the other characters in play like because she is so unreliable I, ca I really can't form any kind of impression of all of these other characters and I think part of like I was saying, I think part of the thrill of having several points of view is having that sort of unspooling realization that people whose heads you've been in for a while maybe are not as reliable as you thought they were initially or maybe have like left significant pieces of what's going on out. I think that that's like a really engaging and enjoyable part of this kind of a mystery. So in the case of They All Fell Down, I just think it was a situation where by picking the wrong point of view character and then only having one point of view character, it makes the mystery as a whole, I think, really flat and just like unsatisfying in the end. Like, I just think it felt much more like a character study that had mystery thriller elements incorporated rather than a mystery thriller per se. The other thing that They All Fall Down does that I think is just a mistake in these kinds of books is that it doesn't have a body until like I think more than half way through. And to me, mostly, and I'm not going to say always because like there's always exceptions, but most of the time it is a mistake to not have a body count pretty early on. We'll talk about this again with Death in the Family, but like one of the things that I think and then there were none and then there were none does is that it actually, you know, there is a build up to the first body dropping. There definitely is. Part of what is thrilling about it is that you know what the stakes are. The stakes are death. Pretty early on you find out not only has one person died, but like everybody that we've met up till that point 
point is also at risk of dying. Like that is part of what you are like afraid of for on behalf of the characters. And like, even though you find out things about these characters that like make it clear that they are not the best people, you still really care about them. Like even, I don't know, I think that's one of the brilliant things about like how invested you get in the characters in this book is that you know almost like not from the very beginning, but from early on in the book, you know that most of the people that you are following are kind of pieces of shit. But because you are in all of their perspectives, you're very sympathetic to them. And I think that what and maybe I should pause because I think the next point I'm about to make gets into what kept death in the family from being even better. But all that to say, I think what they all fall down made me really reflect on in terms of this trope is that A, I really do think you need multiple perspectives for this trope to be at its most efficient or like most effective and impacting because I think the layeredness to the perspectives of different characters is important. Two, I think that having a body not come in until like way late, relatively speaking in a, in a book like this, I've noticed that before, but this like really cemented it for me, which like is that it's just not a good idea. Like you need to have somebody die like within the first quarter of the book to really up the ante and make the characters aware of what the stakes are if it is truly going to be a whodunit in the ilk of And Then There Were None. Like you need that to happen pretty early on. And then I would also say third, like I said, I think having from the jump one, like one character whose perspective you know is not reliable is probably not the best choice for this kind of story. And again, I think this transitions into something I wanna talk about with Death in the Family, but I'll, but I'll just mention again that having the character having only one perspective character was a was a weakness and then having that character have like mental illness that really made it clear that you couldn't trust what she was saying was a was a mistake. Things I did like about this book is that um, some of the kind of existential questions that it was wrestling felt much more contemporary. Did I actually, by the way, did I even mention the setup for this one? So it's a retelling, I should, it's a retelling and it's a retelling where all these characters are going to this luxurious island estate in Mexico. Our perspective character thinks she has been chosen for a reality show that's going to take place there and quickly finds out that the other people who have been invited have been told slightly different things and that they all know a couple of the same people. And so it is the same type of trope, but that is the setup. And I think this introduced some really interesting themes about race um, because our main character is a person of color. It has some interesting things about like reality TV and sort of like online, like social media scandal stuff. And here, like there's, I think that the thematic content of this is interesting and like could have been an interesting layer to this type of story, but I just don't think it ended up being that effective. All again, I'm a broken record here because of the main character. So that's my problem with uh, They All Fall Down. Like I said, I think I'd give that like two or two and a half stars and I would read more about that character in a different kind of book. And I would read more from the author, but I just think that for this trope, it didn't end up being very effective. Then we get to Death in the Family, which I think much more effectively delivered on like the fun aspects of this trope. Like this hit my pleasure buttons of what it is I like about this trope very effectively. Like it was just giving it to me. Like we immediately get to this, we get to the mystery very quickly. Almost from the jump, the setup for this one, I'll remember to do earlier in the review. The setup for this one is that there is a police detective in upstate New York and she's kind of new to the force and she was like we get an initial flashback, flashback that implies that she was maybe um, the victim of a serial killer who she was pursuing as a part of her job when she was a detective in New York. But like, we don't totally know how that panned out. Obviously she's still alive. So, you know, she survived. At the beginning, all we know is that she has moved to, she's moved upstate so that she can kind of get away from whatever it was that happened in New York. And she's with her fiance, who she met as a part of that investigation. Pretty much the first thing that happens is that she is with her partner. They get a call that somebody is missing from this like fancy pants estate like rich people lake house thing and there's a bunch of blood everywhere and he's missing so they are trying to get up to the house and then like there's this big storm happening so then there's like this element of like are they getting you know like what like can they get out once they get to this sort of island thing so i think this is one that hits a lot of the things that i think work really well in this type of trope like i mentioned we get we get to getting almost immediately <laughs> Like we get our body very early on. This is another one where we only have one point of view character, but 
I think in this case, because the person is not one of the suspects, I'm not, I think it's okay. I, you don't really have, a, an, she's a detective, she's coming in. I never really felt like she was one of the people who could have done it um, in terms of like the initial missing person's case and then like what happens sub after that. So I think that that's actually in this situation, okay that there is only one point of view character. I think that this book has the pleasure of the like confinement, like everybody is trapped together and you're finding out about like secrets from the past and you're trying to figure out like who you can trust and who you can't like it's it's got all of that it does have an escalation of the violence I do think it took a really long time for that to happen and I think ideally that probably would have happened earlier and like my biggest beef with this was that it it was acting like it was plausible that somebody who went missing and had like a bunch of blood in their bed was not dead like the family kept acting like no oh, it's just this guy's like playing a prank on us and I'm just like that is that doesn't make any sense so like that was a contrivance I did not enjoy in this book and the other thing that I think kept this from being great and in contrast to and then there were none is that the writing itself was not very strong like it was fine I would call it like workmanlike probably like it was sufficient to get the job done but it wasn't, it was by no means beautiful. And I just don't think it really had a lot of like thematic depth to it. In contrast to, and then there were none, which I think actually has like, like all it is is thematic depth. <laughs> like, uh, and then there were none is sort of like an existential horror story kind of, because like all of these characters are like reckoning with their past in a way that is like really intense and because they're trapped on this island and they don't know who did it and they're all scared. I think that's part of it is because this book tried to act like, oh, well, maybe there's not actually a killer around. I think that that really diminished opportunities to create the atmosphere of terror that is really fun in these kinds of books. Like in these kinds of books, it's really f like part of what is interesting is watching how people who are scared react to escalating circumstances. Like that's part of the enjoyment. And because these people were not, they didn't seem that scared. I think it kept it from having the stakes raised consistently throughout. I just think that that was a weird choice and I just don't totally understand it. So anyway, I think that this hit a lot of the things that I enjoy in this kind of uh, story because it did have a lot of like unfurling secrets from the past. It had a lot of things are not as they seem kind of ness. I do like if there's gonna be characters who know each other, especially if it's like a family that it had like intense family drama happening in a way that I thought was fun. But I would say that the characters all seem very, like seem pretty flat. And like I said, I just don't think that this had like the thematic depth that would make this an excellent version of the trope. I think what it is, is a very effective mystery thrillery kind of book that fails to be memorable in this way because it doesn't have the beautiful writing. It doesn't have that like thematic depth to it. And it doesn't have enough of an escalation of a, a sense of terror all around. So to start to wrap up my thoughts here, I guess what I would say is that I think my like kind of reflection from having read these two and thinking about them in relation to and then there were none is that it made me realize that I really do think as long as the characters aren't bad and the writing isn't bad, this very much I think is a plot first kind of genre convention. Like you can get, at least in my book, you can get away with a lot in terms of not having to have like the best characters, the most interesting themes, etc. if you can deliver the key parts of the plot that I'm expecting. So I think that's interesting because it is a plot related trope that I'm talking about here. So I guess that that makes sense on some level. But I guess for me, what I was interested to kind of reflect on is, okay, like it is plot first, like as long as you deliver those plot things, like competently, I'm gonna get into this and I'm gonna enjoy it. But if you don't have that thematic depth, if you don't have those characters who are really fleshed out and like really interesting, I just think you're never gonna get to the same level as in Then There Were None. Or, you know, even some of the like as good a version of that trope but are still good ones like Death on the Nile, I think is a another one that is not as an isolated close circle mystery, maybe not as satisfying as in Then There Were None, but has the great characters, has the thematic depth for this kind of story and I think ends up therefore being 
more interesting or more satisfying than a lot of the ones that I try to read uh, in this subgenre. So I guess maybe all that to say, if there is a classic in a genre, there's probably a reason why that book is a classic. And it's because it's able to synthesize all the core parts of what makes a book in that category satisfying, along with all of the extra bells and whistles that make it like really memorable and really great, if any of that made sense. Okay, I'm gonna speed through the rest of this and we'll chat here in a second. Alrighty, so I'm done putting on my makeup now and I hope you guys enjoyed the sort of rambly ass meta conversation about this trope that I enjoy using two examples contrasting to like the OG of this particular trope or genre, whatever. In terms of ratings, obviously this is like the mama to rule them all. This is the best one. This is like not even five stars. This is like 10 stars. This is so good. Uh, I would give Death in the Family by Tessa Wieger four stars and I would recommend it to people who really like that kind of a whodunit. If you're not that into the trope, I think it's only okay. So like more, maybe like more of three star. But if you really like this genre, the subgenre the way I do, I think you will enjoy that book a lot. And then They All Fall Down, I think I have to give like two, two and a half stars too. I just don't think it didn't deliver on the retelling that was kind of promised. But all of them have a lot of similarities beyond just that trope. It also, they all have water as kind of the reason why you can't get out and being lured somewhere under false pretenses. Like they have some similarities even beyond just the trope. So I hope you guys enjoyed sort of a different take on this series, this review series I've got going here on the channel. But yeah, I think that that will do it for me for now. So let me know if you've read any of these books below or if you have any recommendations of isolated close circle mysteries that you have enjoyed. Uh, I'm always looking for more. I've got a couple of bookshelves over on Goodreads that have ones that I think are actual isolated close circle mysteries and ones that are almost isolated close circle mysteries, like isolated close circle mystery adjacent. You know, something like a locked room mystery, for example, is kind of in that same ilk, but not exactly the same thing. So anyway, uh, let me know if you've got any ones that you particularly love or what you thought of any of the ones I mentioned today. And yeah, I think that that will do it for now. So if you enjoyed today's video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social meds if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, along with a link to register to vote. And I think that that will do it for now. I hope you guys are having an absolutely lovely day today, and I will just talk to you soon. Bye!